Welcome back, Lexophiles. Today's word is gender. What is it? How many are there? And why does it matter? And who caused this mess to begin with? Definition. Gender. Noun. A class or grouping of grammatical words in a language. English has no grammatical gender, but does have three gendered pronouns. He, she, and it. It is also used interchangeably with sex. History and etymology. We're going to start back with the Proto-Indo-European root of the word gender, gene, which meant to give birth or beget. This initial relationship with birthing would seem to imply a very close tie to sex and genitals in the development of the word gender. But even to my surprise, as I was researching it, this was not the case. Instead of taking a route through separating men and women, it became the word genus, which means the same thing today as race, stock, family, order, or species. It became a word that sorts things into any number of groups, not just two. As this Latin word genus moved into vulgar and popular Latin, and that eventually formed its way into Old French, genus became genre. That's another word that was adopted directly into English that differentiates groups of things. And due to a quirk of Old French, another variant of the word came about gendre. And as many words, it finally came into the English language during the Norman invasion of England, and it became gender. At this time, it was used purely to reference grammatical classes for words, and it remained this way until the late 20th century. In 1955, sexologist John Money introduced this confusion we're running into today. Before his work, it was uncommon at best for the word gender to refer to biological sex. Money's usage of the word gender as interchangeable with sex didn't actually catch on until the 1970s, when feminists in academia embraced his textbook, Man and Woman, Boy and Girl. With academia's acceptance of this usage for the word gender, it was only a matter of time before it would cause confusion relating to biological sex. Prescription. At the beginning of this video, I said that gender is used interchangeably with sex. This is only a descriptive definition of the word, because that's the way I currently see the word being used. Even in Lacey Green's video about how many genders there are, she used these two words interchangeably, sex and gender. Now, as a lexicographer, it's not my job to tell people how to use words, but to describe how they're being used. But as a content creator and cultural commentator, it is my job to tell you what I think about how the words should be used. And so that's what I'm going to do. And what I think really needs to happen is we need to separate the word sex from gender. If we want it to have any meaning at all and have any kind of constructive conversation about how to use the word gender and different gendered pronouns in our language. Sex needs to remain a biological term based on chromosomes and whether your body naturally creates eggs or sperm. This is important for physicians in attempting to diagnose patients accurately. And with my lack of knowledge in biology, and since we're discussing the word gender, I'm going to leave the sex debate for later. What I really want to discuss is the purpose of language, and more specifically, the purpose and usage of pronouns in English. Many languages throughout the world do have more than one gender category, usually only masculine, feminine, or neuter, but at least one language has over 150 genders for objects of varying sizes, shapes, and even moisture content. Historically, Old English had the usual three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. There was a time in the history of the English language that pronoun use was solely tied to the noun it was referring to. In Old English, if somebody was referring to a shield, the pronoun they would use would be the feminine, she. Even in early English translations of the Bible, when Eve is referred to in the capacity of being Adam's wife, the masculine pronoun is used. 
She's referred to as a he. This is why I find the biological argument for keeping gendered pronouns as they are to be completely faulty and easily refuted. I think there might be a better argument from linguistics and the usefulness of language that can be made for why we need to keep the binary language we have today. And that argument is for simplicity and clarity. In the past, gender wasn't determined by biology, but by the noun being used. And if you use the wrong pronoun that didn't match the gender of the noun, it could cause confusion. Just like if you misgender someone today, it can cause confusion about who you're talking about. Modern day English has three gendered pronouns, he, she, and it. It refers primarily to inanimate objects and sometimes to people and animals if the sex is unknown. He and she, on the other hand, are closely tied to sex and secondary sex traits. In English, gender appears to be based on two things, appearance and role in the reproduction process, instead of on the particular noun used in the sentence. An example of how this usage of gender may have been useful is with farm animals, where it may be important to quickly communicate and keep track of the sex of the animals for breeding. In humans, though, that's where secondary sex characteristics appear to play a much bigger role. We don't generally need to know a person's biological sex during everyday interactions, but it is helpful to have a vague idea of their appearance, and the masculine and feminine pronouns can help in this area. It's understandable that not everyone's appearance matches their role in the process of reproduction, and they may want to be referred to by the opposite pronoun, but this is generally an exception to the rule. Now, language is a tool for communication between people, and with any tool there needs to be a certain balance between precision and simplicity. Recently I saw a great example of this on the computer file channel. They were explaining why computers used binary instead of a decimal system. Computers work by sending signals of varying voltages. If the voltage is 5 volts above ground potential, it's a 1. And if it's 5 volts below ground potential, it's a 0. It's simple. Computers could have been designed with a decimal system in mind, where 5 volts below is 0 and 5 volts above is a 9. The problem occurs is when the voltages drift. If the voltage only reaches 2.6 above, it might return a 7 instead of an 8 as it was supposed to, thus causing a problem to occur within the system and within this technology. And just like a computer, English is a technology just like any other. We need to strike the balance between simplicity and precision. So let's assume that gender is a spectrum, just like the voltages in a computer. If someone appears to be closer to one end of this spectrum than the other, it should be reasonable to use that pronoun, at least until you've gained more information about the person. This computer example seems to me to describe how people use the masculine and feminine pronoun today. If something looks or behaves closer to one end of the spectrum, they use the closest of the two pronouns. This seems to limit the confusion of too many words. It keeps the words in reference to external features, making them more useful to people who may not know the person you're referring to. It also maintains gender as a purely grammatical construction and divorces it from someone's internal identity. It references external features. This seems to allow maximum freedom for both parties and maintain simplicity. It frees the subject from worrying about what someone else is going to refer to them as. And it frees the speaker from the tyranny of the demands put on their personal thoughts by the subject's ego. And if you're really dead set on having a word that represents your identity and who you really are, well, English already has a mechanism for that. It's called the proper noun. Yes, your name contains the information about who you are what you are inside. One last note on gendered pronouns. Another option I hear brought up is using they in the singular. I don't find this unacceptable in a lot of cases, but in most circumstances it leaves out pertinent information and can leave even more confusion about the number 
of people referring to. So I don't feel this is a better alternative than the binary solution we already have. Ultimately though, language is something that's spontaneously created by the people using it. Words and grammar have been popping in and out of existence since a caveman pointed at a rock and grunted. If a third gendered pronoun catches on in English, it might not be a bad thing, but only if it's voluntarily accepted by the people speaking the language. The last thing we need cropping up is a dictionary of new speak that must be followed in all communication. It'll be a double plus bad day when the words we use are mandated by any authority other than our own will. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this exploration of the word gender, please leave a like. And if you have anything you'd like to say, let me know in the comments below. Most importantly, if you're a lexophile like me, hit the subscribe button and join me on my journey through the English language. And if you really like what I'm doing, please consider becoming a patron to the channel or using the Amazon affiliate link below.